here. And let's dive in. What did we learn yesterday? We learned um, well, your resources, your cards. Yep, we worked on uh, using bootstrap components, right? These predefined, pre-built things for us. Uh, we used the cards, we used a button, uh, we worked our way up to the nav bar, which is where I think we left off, right? Mm -hmm. um, this notion that we don't always have to make everything from scratch. We can reuse things that uh, the lovely people at what used to be Twitter uh, made for us. So that's where Bootstrap came out of. A bunch of these Twitter engineers said, hey, this is silly. We build this same CSS over and over again for all of our different websites. Wouldn't it be nice if we just had one CSS file that would give us access to all of these things we end up rebuilding on every page? Um, and so that's where Bootstrap was born out of, of this notion of, hey, can we make that reusable CSS and document it so other people can use it as well? What else did we do yesterday? Do we have any light bulb moments? We used prettier. Which we used prettier. I'm not sure if it's prettier. <laughs> Prettier, I warn you guys now, there is certainly a uh, hate period that you go through before you get to love. Um, it is not a requirement to leave it on, but I do recommend uh, keeping it on for at least a week. See what you think about it. See how it's indenting. If you hate it, you can always turn it off. But um, I recommend toughing it out because you do get to the point of realizing how helpful it is as you work with it. So, um, mm -hmm. Tina, go ahead. If you could run back uh, the instructions on how to download it, yeah, sure. I missed it was it was quick, and I missed it. Um. So, um, I don't know if that shared the right desktop. Let me try that again. Okay, it did. Uh, over here on the left. Uh, let me just quickly reload that. Uh, up at the top, you can do a search for prettier. It is going to be the one all the way up at the top that has like 25 million downloads. You'll get a little blue install button here. I have the gear because I already have it installed. Then up at the top, if you go to code, preferences, and settings, you can do a search for format. And you want to make sure format on save is, turned, uh, is checked and turned on. And then if you do a search for formatter, you want to make sure it's set to prettier here. And then anytime you save, it will automatically indent your file for you. So I have a question. Mine's grayed out. Like it won't let me, I was having this issue yesterday. It wouldn't let me just go into the settings. So make sure that you're in your window, not a live share window, and make sure you have a file open. Uh, sometimes oh, you go into- file open. Okay. Sometimes when you go into settings, you're doing it on the live share window and you can't turn on my prettier, which is why it's great app. Okay. Thank you. I got it. Anything else from yesterday? Anything to recap? Any light bulb moments? Any moments where we were particularly proud of what we were accomplishing? Well, go ahead. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, we copied our first bit of JavaScript. Yeah, how are we feeling about that? It was interesting to see the way that it, the way that JavaScript modifies the page versus the way that HTML does. Yes. Yep, we will definitely be getting into that. We've got one week of HTML left, uh, not counting today and tomorrow. Then uh, you get a break from me and Nathan Evan comes in and does a DevOps module where you learn to actually deploy your code and get it live on the internet. And you can actually send it to your friends and family and be like, look, I made this. Um, and then I come back and we dive right into JavaScript. So that's what's coming down the pipeline. Jennifer, were you gonna say something? Yeah, so last night, second half, I was so lost. And I sat here getting more and more upset until I was just like tearing up. 
and it was going so fast. And I was like, why can't I follow this? Where did I get lost? And then at the end of class, you said, you probably just one step behind when you think you're really five steps behind. And I looked at it after class ended and I was like, oh, wait a minute. We just had to enter in profile about, or, you know, contact. Everything else was just like the, um, the JavaScript information and what else was there? The nav bar information. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And, and that's, what's really, you know, I, I say this over and over again of like, learning to think like an engineer, right? Looking at those steps, breaking that down, realizing that yes, it is going very fast, but um, it is going fast because it's that same step over and over again, right? And that's a, a hard thing because our education system uh, trains you how to perform steps. It doesn't necessarily always uh, get you to think about what those steps actually are, right? So this is going back to, um, going back to math class, right, where you're learning how to solve a formula and you're solving it on both sides of the equation and you see the teacher doing it and you're like, yeah, I, I can do that. I can subtract six. I can do all of that stuff. And then they put a, a different formula in front of you and it's like, oh, I've got to I've, I've got to figure out the steps myself. The first step isn't always subtract from one side, right? I've got to figure out what the right first step is here. Maybe there's a square there. Maybe, I don't know, there's X on one side that you've got to move over. Um, and so that's the, the process of learning how to code, right? It's figuring out, hey, this isn't just about changing the things and having this pop up. It's about realizing, oh, we have a nav bar that's got dropped in there. What do we need to change to make the nav bar look the way I want it to? Or, oh, that menu button is broken. Why is the menu not working? Let's figure out where that JavaScript is and try and catch up there, right? Um, that's what thinking like the engineer is and why those homework assignments are so important, right? Because we uh, design our homework assignments to kind of push you out of the nest a little bit, right? To say, hey, you got to do this from scratch. This is how you prove that you're understanding these concepts is because you're not following along somewhere. You're able to say, where do I start? I always start with a new HTML page. I've got to link my CSS. And you once you get that momentum going, once you get over that sheer shock of having the empty blinking cursor, um, it becomes much easier to start building out your pages. Artrell, go ahead. Yeah, to build upon what you're saying, I feel like I'm kind of like in that stage also, like with Jennifer. Like last night, I was dreaming about code. And I feel like if you show me, for the most part, an HTML page that we worked on, I can break down, explain to you what it is and what it's supposed to do. And I know that's what you want us to learn. I Absolutely. feel like my issue is me applying it myself, just, you know, with the blank canvas, it's like, uh, I have an idea what to do, but I'm better at saying, all right, this right here means X, Y, Z. And this right here means X, Y, Z. So yeah, I don't feel like I'm just like behind, but just, I just feel stuck and i don't know if that's the um the the imposter model thing or whatever but like i swear i'm just like eh. thank you for sharing yeah it's it's something that you know you build with time and um you may get into javascript and uh realize that you hate html and javascript where is where the party's at right or vice versa you may find out that uh html is your jam and this javascript stuff is even harder than the html uh, everyone has different strengths and learning styles, and uh, it's important to share those moments, right? That's why I spend the first 10 or 15 minutes of class. Um, it's it's kind of like improv for me, right? Vibing on where you guys are at, expanding on that a little bit. But I find that um, when I'm working, when I come in at nine o'clock in the morning and I power up my computer, I'm looking at my code and I'm like, who in God's name wrote this, right? Like you're like, uh, someone, a ghost came in last night and wrote code. I don't remember doing any of this. And so that's why I do this, this stand up is one in the workforce every day. Um, most companies will ask you, what did you do yesterday? What are you doing today? Do you have any roadblocks? Right. That is that is what we call stand up because it is important to think about 
wait, where did I leave off yesterday? What did I get done? What was something that popped up that I didn't realize I was going to have to spend time on? Let me share that with my team. But then while I'm thinking about all of that, I also need to plan out my day, right? Because we don't just sit down and code for eight hours and then get up and leave. We need to do our project planning. We need to figure out what our tasks are. We need to go from there, right? Um, and then identifying roadblocks because coding is often a team sport, right? Um, you're going to be reliant on end users giving you more information about a bug. You're going to be reliant on the designers who are uh, handing you a mock-up for you to implement. You're going to be reliant on DevOps for uh, getting your application deployed and making sure there aren't any issues. You're going to be waiting on QA to test all of your code, quality assurance, right? Um, and so that's why we we touch on this stand up one because it's used in the real world, but two, it kind of sets us up to resume back into whatever project we were working on, or use that momentum from the last project we finish to bring it into the next project we're we're about to start. Um, and so that's that's why I I, um, I do this exercise is it, it's um, industry standard, but also I think a good way to kind of get the brain juices flown again and thinking about what we were working on yesterday. Ariel made a, a good point in chat. Um, she said it's easy to rubber duck yourself, uh, taking it out in stand up as well. Um, so do it yourself before you work on things as as well to get in the habit, right? So when you're sitting down Saturday morning, you're ready to knock out the homework, do a little recap, right? Think about, hey, let me just jot down a, a half a page of notes about what I learned, right? Let me just capture that. The hardest part of being an engineer um, is often getting out of your own head, right? And I find that getting out of your own head and diving right into code is something that you do get better at with experience. It's not something you should be trying to do now, right? That blank cursor is going to be so intimidating. Um, the I find the best way to get out of your head is to brain dump onto a whiteboard or a notebook first, right? Or index cards or post-it notes or whatever it is. Whenever you're about to start a new project or dive into the homework or try and accomplish something that needs you to think like an engineer, don't go right to the computer. Don't just start coding things out. Have that, that step of saying, let me just get everything out of my brain first, and then I can start picking up those stickies or crossing things off the list or, uh, you know, getting a different color marker out on the whiteboard when I finish something off, because that level of organization is something that's going to make you a successful engineer. Anything else before we dive back into our portfolio site? I do have a couple reminders. Okay, well, to prove my point, I can't remember anything when uh, something pops into my head and I go, oh, I gotta, I gotta, uh, I gotta tell the students that. And then I promptly forget. So I always have a, outline nearby or a notebook so that I can capture all of that. So a couple notes before we dive back in. Um, we are moving quiz due dates. Due dates for quizzes will no longer be on Wednesday or Thursday. Um, I think they were Thursday before class. We are moving them to Sunday at 1159. So your um, quizzes will be due at the same time as your weekend homework assignments. Um, a reminder that while we do not penalize you for being late, um, if you turn it in by the due date, you are often likely to get your grade back faster and get feedback on your assignment as well. So um, recommending that you um, that you turn it in by the due date um, so that you're able to get the feedback on that sooner. Um, the quiz is already live in uh, Canvas for this week. You can wait until tomorrow if you want, um, or you can take it now whenever. Just Sunday, 11.59 will be the new due date for all quizzes. Um, I did post a poll in um, Slack. I will send a link in Zoom in case you missed it. There are two questions to uh, to answer in there around common space memberships. 
Um, we are working with the management at Common Space to figure out um, what access times work best for everyone or who would be interested in 24 hour access uh, for an additional fee. Um, so if you guys can fill out that poll by just clicking the one, two or three numbers in the first one and then one or two on the second one, um, if you already filled it out, obviously you don't need to do anything, but um, we do have a couple options in there for common space. So I will shut up for 30 seconds and let you guys read that uh, before we move on. There are five votes in there and 19 of you in class. So encouraging everyone to click on the link in the Zoom chat and go ahead and vote now before we move on with class. This is in Slack, this is not in Zoom directly. And you don't know what the times we select are permanent, right? I do not know. That is something I'll ask once we get uh, the majority of students voting in. Okay, I already voted. So Max, I would be interested in a membership. The problem is, I don't know that it would be worth the small amount of time I'd have to use it, right? Like on a Friday after work, I could do that. But every other night I'd be in class with you and I'd be at work during the day. Yeah, the thinking was for that one to nine common space access that you would you would have the option of joining class from down there to to try and get out of your house. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, you could just, you know, wear headphones there and, and tune into class. So that was my thinking of shifting it to that one to nine time slot was that, you know, you would still have time, um, to, to, um, you know, get down there, use the space in the afternoon if your work schedule allowed, um, and then to tune in for class. Um, so that's, that's why I was thinking along those lines. Um, and then the um, 24 hour access is obviously an option as well. Um, and that would also be on the weekend um, so that you would be able to use that Saturday, Sunday um, if, if you know, you're trying to get out of the house. Um, Onondaga Library is an, a great another option. Um, so we're, we're just trying to, you know, figure it out just because we've done fully virtual cohorts where common space was closed and there was was no option for for that. Um, we've done um, now uh, this is our second kind of hybrid uh, option and we've got classroom space mostly covered for the couple random weeks that we are in person for class. Um, but we just want to give you guys as many options as possible and know um, that getting out of your house can be very important. So uh, that's that's why we're polling is just trying to figure out where the majority of people are um, and how many people would would be interested in that membership. Okay. Um, thank you guys for voting on that. I will take that uh, data and work with uh, Jesse and figure out what the next steps will be from there. Um, quick reminder that um, in the student success channel, Jason has put in times to either pick up your debit card or request that it gets mailed to you. Um, if you have any questions on that, feel free to ask me or uh, just message Jason directly. Um, I believe almost everyone has filled out all the correct paperwork. I, I won't single you out, but there is only one of you left who still needs to fill out your W-9. Um, so uh, thank you guys for, for staying on top of that. And don't forget to pick up your debit cards because your first $240, I believe, will be available um, early next week so that you'll be able to use that as soon as you get the cards. Um, if you guys are ever looking for a um, recommendation for any hardware or anything like that, 
Um, always feel free to shoot me a Slack message or ask the TAs. Um, all of us have our own uh, different hardware setups and have found gear that we love. Um, you know, it's a lot like a carpenter using their tools. Um, same for a developer, right? All of the hardware that we have, your desk space, your keyboard, your mouse, all of that um, is very important to us doing the job uh, that we are learning how to do. Um, Christina, important. I, getting out of your house is more of a um it's very important to be able to socialize as a developer because working in a team working as a developer is nine times out of ten at a company uh, a team sport right you're going to be working with other developers um you're uh, as a junior developer you're going to need to lean on senior developers uh, to give you guidance and get you unstuck and that kind of stuff. Um, so it's important to be able to um, socialize and oftentimes you can uh, get stuck in a rut, right? Where you're like, I'm stuck on this problem. I've been sitting at my desk for four hours. I just can't get over it. Um, so when that happens uh, for me, sometimes I'll go down to Cafe Kubal, which is right down the street. I'll get a coffee. I'll be sitting there. I'll put on my noise canceling headphones and the fix just hits me. And I'm like, oh my God, I, I got it. Right. And I'll just go running on it. Where if I had just sat at my desk the whole time, yeah, it's great. I've got my two 28 inch monitors and, you know, I'm, this is my productive space. But at the same time, um, sometimes I just need a change of scenery in order to get things working. Some for some people that's taking your computer from your, uh, you know, from your desk and going over to the couch or the dining room table and working on it there. Um, sometimes people need to put on music. Sometimes people need to stop the music that's playing. Um, I'm someone who works uh, with music on almost all day. When I'm not inside of a meeting, I've got something playing. Uh, in fact, you've probably seen my little headphone icon show up in Slack that will show you what I'm, I'm listening to. Um, I, I, that's how I work. Some people uh, like music on, but it can't have any uh, words in it. You know, they like more ambient music. Uh, some people can't work with any music on because it distracts them and, and they can't focus. So um, every, every individual is different. Um, and I know uh, uh, Karen and Ariel chimed in in the chat as well. Um, so it's just a matter of finding what works for you. Um, and that's the nice thing about common space is that, um, or any co-working space is that the people there are in a similar situation, right? Where they can work remotely, they can work anywhere but they have found that getting out of their house is important, whether they don't have a space set up for it um, at their own house or whether they have a, a perfect office set up for it and uh, what they need is just a change of scenery or um, some people find it hard to focus in their house, right? Oh, let me go do the laundry. Oh, the laundry's done, let me go fold that. Oh, while I'm here, let me go get a snack, right? And it's like, well, I'm here to work, right? If I were in an office, I wouldn't be getting up to fold the laundry. So I either need to work on my, um, my hey, when I'm in the office, I'm working, or when I'm at my desk, I'm working mentality, or some people solve that with a co-working membership or going down to the coffee shop or something like that. So those are all factors of why um, we're pulling you guys for the common space access and trying to move money around to make it a little bit more affordable for you guys. Um, because some of you are like remotes, where it's at? Like, I like remote learning. I don't want to ever go anywhere. I want to stay here. And other people are like, I got a tiny apartment and there's my roommates are around me and all I want to do is is zone in and I need to get out of here in order to be able to do that. So it, it's it's not just about your learning style. It's also about, um, you know, focus and, and stuff like that. For me, when I'm in this office, I'm working, right? I don't do anything on my computer in this office that's a tangent. I don't watch Netflix. I don't do any of that. If I want to do that, if I want to take a break, I literally unplug my computer and walk over to the dining room. And now my, my brain has switched. 
now I'm in, all right, I'm in relaxed mode. I can do whatever. I can read the news on my computer or whatever. But my physical line of separation is when I'm in my, my office, this room, I am going to be working and I'm never going to blur the lines between those two. And that's where I find uh, my productivity kicks in is because I have that physical space separation. It's the exact same laptop when I take it out of the room, but that's how I enforce uh, productivity while working at home. Sorry, I'm just reading your, your chat messages. Okay. Um, thank you guys for voting on that. Quizzes are moving to Sunday due dates. Um, I want to do a quick rundown of the capstone requirements. Uh, we are going to introduce you guys to the capstone tonight. I would recommend everyone pop open this capstone uh, re uh, requirements document because it is a couple pages long. I'm going to do a brief overview of what the capstone is, what an MVP is, which I know we touched on a little bit, uh, your check-in dates, and then uh, a heads up of what the week five homework assignment is. Alba, go ahead. Minus saying I need access. Refresh the page. Thank you. Sorry, thank you for calling me out on that. Um, so uh, we have the week five homework assignment up. I will explain that in a moment, um, but let me dive into Capstone here. Uh, if at any point you have any questions, just go ahead and raise your hand. So the main thing to think about your Capstone project here is this is the project that's going to encapsulate all of the knowledge that you're learning throughout the program. So at the end of this, it's not super important that you have a fully featured app that's ready to you know, go out to the world and be used. And this is all about taking what you're learning and applying it to your own kind of passion project, right? Hmm. And so there's a, a wide range of different projects that people do for their capstone. Some people are overly ambitious and think they're going to build a whole app and what they end up building is a little two-page site. There are some people that get to the end of the program and meet all the requirements and they're like, oh, well, I have extra time. I can throw additional features in here. That's rarely the case, but every now and then it does happen. So um, the project needs to be full stack. I know you guys don't have backend or database experience yet. That's okay. When we get down a little bit further, um, I'll give you guys the breakdown of what you should have done in your in your capstone at which point. Um, right now, we're feeling front end out, right? We've got wireframes that we know how to do. We've been working with our HTML. We're getting uh, up to the point where we now have enough knowledge to go apply that to something else that we're working on. Um, so the project has to be full stack. Um, and your project idea can really be very wide ranging. We've had some people um, do kind of like a business directory website. We've had some people build uh, a walking tour app that played audio based off of where your GPS was. So kind of think like when you're going through a museum and it, it uh, plays the audio clips. Um, they built that with GPS and, and was like an outside walking tour. Um, we had two people last cohort actually build a shopping list app um, that would let you load up the list. Uh, one of them had pulled in every item from Wegmans and actually had the database of everything in a Wegmans store. We had uh, another student focus on uh, what they call the traveling salesman problem, where you've got a couple stops you need to make to pick up things in different aisles. What's the shortest route in order to get all of those items? Um, so the, the projects can be really wide ranging. This is about you identifying a pain point in your life or some website that you wish you had or the community had. Um, it does not matter if it already exists either. So if you have a website, uh, if you found something and you're like, I wanna make my own version of this, or I know this exists, but I think this is gonna be good practice or I could see myself using it, that is a good way to find your, your project and your idea. Brandon, go ahead. 
I was just wondering, um, because you brought this, um, brought up the idea of thinking about what ideas you may have. Um, would it be too complicated uh, to make like a game, like kind of like flash games, like from the semi olden days or things like that? Or yeah, so I would. Um... The answer is, of course you can, but I'm going to give a, a word of caution there. Of um, We have had some students at the top of the class who are already bored at this point and just want to get going, um, go out and learn some additional skills that are not covered in our curriculum. So um, while that is completely fine to do on your capstone, your capstone does not need to be an exact um, match of our stack. For example, um, the student who got every Wegmans product into his app um, used scraping, uh, which is a uh, uh, concept where basically you can go out on someone else's website and scrape the data off of that website into their own database. Um, so that's not a skill that we teach. That's not something that's part of the curriculum, but they were like, that's what I want my capstone to be. I want my capstone to have all that real live Wegmans data and, and um, IO information and all of that stuff. Um, so the word of caution there is not, um, there's nothing wrong with learning an extra tool or uh, using a game framework or something like that. The word of caution on that is that our mentor and TA and instructor network may not be able to help you with those skills, right? So most of our TAs are, um, are graduates who've been through the program. They know JavaScript. They know HTML. When you're stuck somewhere, you schedule a one-on-one, -on -one, chances are someone can help you, right? Uh, but when you're going out and doing, saying, oh, I want to learn a, a game framework there, we might be able to help you if that framework is in JavaScript, we might be able to work through it, but we aren't going to be experts in that. So while that is completely fine to do and students have done that and had success with it, just be prepared for a little less support if you run into problems um, from the Hack Up State Network directly. Thank you. Tina, go ahead. So I was going over um, my ideas and I had this uh, initial idea of um, creating a dating app for like people that have been in the corrections facility, like in the correction system, you know, trying to get back into the dating world. And everyone that I talked to was like, that'll never work. That'll never work. That'll never work. That Doesn't sounds matter. so out of race. Doesn't matter if it will work or not. Doesn't matter if it's a great business idea or a terrible business idea. What matters is that you're excited about it and you can take the concepts you're learning and apply it in a project. So that's why this is so hard to pin down an idea is because it's not, it's not a business pitch, right? At the end of this, you're not trying to get investment money. At the end of this, you may get get done the project and go, I never want to do another dating app again. This is dumb. I hate the dating app, but I took everything that I learned and applied it into this project. That's what matters for the capstone. So I know a lot of you guys have a lot of ideas. Try and narrow that down and say, if I'm sinking 100 hours into this project, which project will I not get sick of while I'm working on it? That's what matters, right? Now, some people have taken their capstones after the program and said, I want to keep working on this, or I actually want this to be an app in the app store, or I want to get business users and have them use it. That's great. But the point of the capstone project is not to have you walking out of here with a fully functional app. It's to get you walking out of here saying, I built this whole thing and I got the practice of everything we learned in class in my own project. That's the point of the capstone. With that said, in tomorrow's class, we are going to actually get you started on the weekend homework assignment. And then I am going to random, uh, generate uh, all of your names in a random order. And while you guys are working on the weekend homework assignment, I'm going to pull you in for one-on-ones, right? For a couple minutes, we're going to talk about your capstone. 
whatever ideas you have, if you need help narrowing it down to one idea, we can talk through the, um, we can talk through that. We're going to go through, make sure that you've got all of your project requirements in there, because you may come to me and be like, I've got this great idea for a website, but I have no idea how I'm going to make a database work inside of it, or I'm worried about X, Y, and Z, right? So um, the problem with a lot of one-on-ones is that it's hard for all 19 of you to find a time that, that works outside of class, right? So tomorrow's class, we're going to do a planning for the homework. We're going to get you started on that homework project like we, we do normally. Um, once we get you guys underway, I'm going to duck out into a breakout room and pull you guys into the breakout room to talk about your capstone idea. So you've got 24-ish hours to get those juices flowing of just what ideas do I have and that's it. That's all you need to come into that meeting with. Don't worry if you don't have the database figured out. Don't worry if you don't have any prep work of it done. That's what tomorrow's meeting is meant to do, is it's going to get you guys practice articulating what your project idea is and how to get it started. From there, the week five homework, not this weekend's homework, the following weekend's homework is to start working on your wireframes and generating an outline. Start thinking about, all right, if I need to build this app before I write a single line of code, what can I plan out about that app, right? This is the, the notion of it's up in your head somewhere and you've got a gazillion tangents going on. Take those tangents and focus them down onto the page. That wireframe can be done in Figma, it can be done on a whiteboard, it can be done with post-it notes, it can be done on a notebook, whatever you guys want to do, that's your starting point for your um, for your capstone. Tomorrow, you're going to have one-on-one -on -one with me, we'll talk through your idea, we'll make sure that you're feeling good about it, or I'll help you narrow down those ideas to one in particular. Then for the following week's assignment, um, you guys can start working on your capstone, right? The non-digital side of things. What should, what do I need to put on the pages? How many pages do I need? Uh, oh, what's going to show up on that page? Am I going to have a nav bar? What's going to happen when I click on this button? That's all for next week. This week is about locking in on your idea. And that's what we'll do on the, during the one-on-ones during tomorrow's class. You don't need to schedule them. It will be during regular class time, but I'll pull you guys in and you'll have a chance to talk through your idea. Any questions on that before I run down the rest of this document? If you are struggling to come up with an idea, think about pain points. Every website I've ever made has been made out of something that I have found super annoying in real life. When I was in college, they had a um, 11 by 17 legal clipboard. And whenever we would get a package, they would write down like the 20 digit tracking number on this, this clipboard. And then they would hand it over to you and you would sign when you picked up your package. And there was no notification that you got a, a package in or they, there was, they put a paper slip in your, in your mailbox. And I'm like, hello, Ooh, we all have iPhones in our pockets and we're writing all of this down. What happens if someone spills some water on that clipboard that's got, you know, a hundred pages worth of package history? So the first app uh, that I made was something that could scan the barcode on the package. It would get the tracking number. It would detect the, the mailbox number and it would email the, the user, hey, you have a package ready for pickup. Then when they showed up at the, at the front, at the desk, you would sign with your finger on the iPad. That would get saved and marked as picked up and then you would get your package. Great capstone project. Not saying that you guys need to take that exact one. What then year I was thought, this? 2012. Oh, okay. Um, then I thought it was really dumb that they passed around an attendance sheet at a 200 person lecture hall and one person wouldn't realize that the clipboard was sitting right next to them and you get to the end of class and everyone was, you know, huddled up at the beginning of, uh, the, of the front of the class trying to check off that they were, they attended. I thought that was really dumb. So I built an app 
that used uh, Bluetooth beacons to detect that you were in the classroom and then automatically checked you in. Great app idea. Maybe a little ambitious, but maybe attendance is something that you think about, right? Lots of different ideas here, and it can be based in your community. It can be something that you wish you had in order to organize things together. There are just countless ideas here. What tomorrow will help you think about is what we call that MVP, the minimum viable product. No, not the most important person. It is about saying what, what set of features is small enough that we can go implement but is still going to provide some value to our end users. So that getting to that MVP is a really hard thing to do on your own. And that's what we'll focus on um, on our one-on-ones is, hey, let's scale that idea down. Let's start to think about all the different features that you want to add to it. Let's say the, let's highlight the ones that are most important focus on those. And when we get those done, then of course, you can always go back and add more into it. The reason from a business perspective that this is important is oftentimes you may have a list of a thousand ideas that you want to add to the app. But when your users start using it, they're going to identify what really needs to be added to the app, not what you think or want to add to the app. Um, but MVP for the sake of, hey, this is a six month boot camp we need to get something out, um, you want to think about MVP. You want to think about scaling it down. If you are still stuck and have no idea what you want to do, you can check out some of the hackathon projects that, that have been done at uh, Hack Upstate in previous years. And you can also check what previous students have done for their capstones and get a better idea of that. Um, so we've got links to all of that in there. Um, here are some examples from other coding boot camps of what people have done from, for the tech stack. Um, don't worry uh, about what tech stack it is. We'll be learning all of that down the road. Now we get down to where should I be at in my project, right? So at the end of week five, going into week six, you should have some planning requirements analysis and design done on your capstone, right? This is not not this upcoming Saturday, the following Saturday. And you should also have an outline or a wireframe um, and optionally mockups done for your app. This is the week five homework assignment. So if you go into Canvas, you can see all the details on this homework assignment. Week 10, we want to see you having some HTML built. We wanna see you having some links between your two pages. We want to see if you've got a form field. Now, your website might not have any form fields, and that's okay. But think about how the data is going to get into your app or your site. Um, and you should also have a login screen start to be built out if the, if the project you have is going to require people to log in. I'm not going to cover anything else for these requirements quite yet, because you guys don't know React. You don't have the back end. You don't want to stress yourselves out about thinking about all of these requirements at the end of the project. Just have that one or two in your head. Hey, we're coming up to the end of another module. I should think about how to take this knowledge and apply it into my project. Um, we will also be doing student progress updates on the following dates in class, normally on a Monday. I know that public speaking may scare the crap out of you guys. However, at your graduation, you will be showing off your capstones from the perspective of, look at what project I made. These check-ins are super important for you guys to get important or to get comfortable about talking about what you've worked on. All of you are going to get stuck somewhere. All of you are going to uh, you know, need a little motivation. Um, sometimes seeing what other students have done will give you a better idea of what to do yourself. The, these check-in dates, while they are scary about having to present in front of other people, they will get you more comfortable and they will give you motivation to continue to keep on working on your capstone. With all of that said, these dates have been added to the, um, 
the spreadsheet with all of the different modules in there. So if you look on 11.7, you'll see that we've got a capstone check-in scheduled for there. You don't necessarily need to prepare anything for those check-ins. You don't need a slide deck. You don't need any of that. What uh, these check-ins will be is we will ask all students, what did you accomplish since your last check-in? Um, what are you planning on working on between now and your next check-in? And do you have any roadblocks? Are you stuck anywhere? Do you need any additional resources? How can we help you during a one-on-one? -on -one? All of that kind of stuff. So it's only three questions that you need to be prepared to answer in addition to showing off what has what you've worked on and what's been done since that last check-in. Um, reminder about blogs, uh, blogging about your capstone as you're working on it is a great idea. We are currently working on updating the Careers in Code website to be able to highlight some of your blog posts. Uh, to get you more exposure uh, of what you're writing. Uh, so a couple notes on that. And then finally, there will be a presentation at graduation. Um, again, it is not a pitch. You are not trying to sell what you have built to anyone. This is about showing off everything you have learned in the context of your project. Uh, and then there are a couple links down at the bottom for additional information and uh, that kind of stuff. I would recommend, I know it's a long document, but everyone read this from top to bottom. And if you have any questions, feel free to bring them either to class tomorrow um, or have them prepared for our first round of one-on-ones where, again, all you need is your project idea or ideas, and we will help you narrow down and focus in on one of them. Questions, comments, concerns? We feel like we've got a better idea of that big capstone word that we've been throwing around. We feeling like we got some ideas flowing. If we don't, we feeling like maybe we'll check out a couple projects from last cohort or think about ways that technology could help us in the real world. It's real now, so <laughs> time to really think about it a lot more. And what we, I know the, the, check-ins are dreaded by most of the students, those check-in dates during class, um, but they really light a fire under your butt of saying, oh man, I've got a checkup coming up on Monday. I've got to spend some time getting it done because what happens to a lot of students is they get to week 15 or 20 and they've been learning so much and they've been turning in homeworks and they think they're doing great. And then they get to week 20 or week 15 and they go, oh, crap. I don't have enough time to build my project. And so that's why we um, have these check-in dates set so that you have a benchmark to say, all right, I can't forget about my capstone week five, week 10, week 15, you know, where should I be? Am I taking what I'm learning and applying it directly to my project? And Ariel made a good point. She said, and don't think if you miss Monday class, we won't make you do it when you come back. You cannot skip your uh, check-in. Uh, we will find you down, hunt you down, and give you a chance to present in class what you have been working on. Uh, skipping class or tuning in an hour late is not going to get you out of it. It's literally easier to just say, listen, I didn't have time to do it this week ask for feedback. Is there anything you think I really need to focus on now than it is to just pretend it's not happening and then show up late because someone will track you down. And that only happened to me two or three or four times. So I'm just speaking from experience. Your capstone is a great manifestation of you kind of doing a self-assessment, right? And saying, all right, am I actually understanding these concepts? Because my capstone should be something that I'm excited about should be something that I want to be out in the real world. It's something that I wish I had myself, right? This is your first chance to build something uh, that, that you can say as a developer, not only did I learn a ton of stuff on this, I'm excited to use this or, or show this off. And that's what a good capstone is. Tika, go ahead. Um, I just wanna say that I appreciate uh, Jordan's laid back style on the camera because like, I, you know, most of my time, my hair is undone, my this, my that, my whatever. 
and I appreciate him having this laid back. So I feel a little bit better, you know. Uh, I'm glad you from the surgery and it's cold, my bad. <laughs> so I'm laying in the recliner. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, for Halloween, uh, costumes will be optional. Uh, if you would like to show up on uh, with a costume, you are totally welcome to on Halloween night, which is, let me make sure it's not like a weekend. I haven't even looked at my calendar. It's on a Monday. Oh, awesome. All right. So uh, Monday, you are well, uh, not next Monday, the uh, two weeks from now, uh, you are welcome to show up in a costume. Oh, damn. I actually won't be your teacher, but I think it will be great for you to meet Nathan for the first time in costume. Just saying. So I just wanted to say that I appreciate Jordan for coming out there and uh leaning back and relaxing and doing everything and just being a person. And, you know, I appreciate that because like my hair is probably all standing up and whatever. Uh, and I try to turn the camera off, uh, but I appreciate that. Mm -hmm, your hair looks great. Looks <laughs> like up in a really nice bun. Thank you for lying. <laughs> oh no, I'm serious. Like what I the, see. The Thank other <laughs> The other nice thing is that if you're on mute, uh, your video does not get captured onto uh, YouTube. Um, so while every while the fellow students can see your video feed, um, the it won't get captured and, and published into uh, the YouTube recording uh, unless you're you you know you come off mute and you're talking. So if you really don't want to be in the recording, you can always turn off your camera and then come off mute and ask a question. Um, but most people watching our video on YouTube, uh, YouTube is going to be one of you guys anyway. It's not like we get, you know, we're racking up millions of views by posting class every night. Um, I know I'm a good teacher, but I'm not that great of a teacher. Well, maybe next year. <laughs> <laughs> it's coming. All right. Any other questions? Um. Yeah, I'm curious about. Well, we'll probably learn it in DevOps, but what's the average cost of renting web space? Sure. Um, you'll definitely learn that in web ops. Uh, web ops. Wow, Max. DevOps. Um, the, uh, for this week, you won't have to pay anything because we'll be deploying what we call a static website, a website that does not have a backend server or API. Um, and GitHub uh, has a product called Pages that they offer for free, uh, where you can deploy your website and not have to pay anything. Mm -hmm. With that said, I believe Nathan will walk you through the steps of buying a domain name. In the GitHub student pack, you can get a domain name free that I believe ends in .dev. Um, or if you would like to buy your own domain name, um, for example, if your first name and last name .com is available, I would recommend buying that um, unless you really like the .dev domain extension and then you can use that. A domain name is usually around $15 a year. It varies based off of what the extension is. So .coms are 15 bucks. Um, I have a uh, .ws, uh, which stands for uh, Western Samoa, I believe. Um, but it, because it's part of my name, I couldn't get maxmatthews.com. So I have M-A-X-M-A-T-T-H-E dot W-S. Um, and I believe I pay $80 a year for that W-S um, domain name. Um, that is, you'll have your debit cards by the time you get to buying a, a domain name. And you're welcome to uh, put the the uh, domain name onto that debit card. Um, or you can also... Um, get that .dev uh, domain name for free from the GitHub student pack. Um, so that will be the only cost. Uh, you can also deploy to GitHub pages without your own uh, domain name. It will be your GitHub username .github.io will be your website. That also works completely fine. Um, and then as we get into the second uh, week of DevOps, which is not all the way until I think week 22 or 23, um, Nathan will be going through how to deploy your backend servers, um, and there will be some costs associated with that. But again, I think the GitHub student pack gives you like $100 in credits, um, so you won't have to pay for that out of pocket. 
a backend web server costs 10 to $15 a month for, you know, a lightweight hobby kind of, you know, I don't have a thousand users using my website. I just want people to be able to use it. Um, and deploying your capstone is not a requirement of the capstone. You guys will learn how to deploy it. Um, but when you come up uh, on stage at graduation to show off your project, um, if you have it running locally, which is what we've been doing so far, um, you do not actually have to have your project deployed. Is it okay if through like this Netflix project, mm -hmm. I'm gonna steal a lot of it for my capstone? Is that okay? Totally fine. As long as you are not, uh, as long as it's not a copyright infringement issue, you can't use the images off someone else's site without permission. Um, how do I like? Uh, do you know anything about like? How do I get a hold of a data? Like, how do I get a database? Well, like, what is a database? We will be learning that. Because, like, if I'm going to have something to stream from, then, you know, like, I obviously have to have that. Think about the database as a multi-tab spreadsheet. So the database is going to have columns at the top, right? That's what you want to store. So for your user's table, you would have first name, last name, email, password. And then the rows of that spreadsheet are going to be, you'll have one row for every user, right? So you'll start filling in that information. Then the database will have multiple tables um, in the uh, spreadsheet that will be multiple tabs down at the bottom, right? So instead of just having a user's tab, you may also have a tab storing um, you know, the comments that user has made. So we'll be covering database design and how to, how to do all of that, um, but that's how you want to think about databases for your capstone project is just a big Excel file or Google Sheets or any any kind of spreadsheet um, with that kind of data inside of it. We ready to dive back into portfolio or do we have any other questions about capstone? Okay, let me share my screen here and we can dive in. So let me close a couple tabs here. I'm gonna close my VS code to get started. I am going to go to Finder. I am going to go to my desktop and my My Code uh, folder. We're gonna open up week four. We're gonna take day two, right click on it and hit uh, duplicate. And once that's done, I'm going to right click on it and hit rename. And I'm going to rename that to day three. If you are far behind and really want to follow along, but your own code is a mess, I am going to put this uh, D3 file into the live stream channel. So if you would rather start uh, today with my code instead of your own code, you are welcome to use uh, that zip file that I just posted in the live stream. I would encourage you to keep on using your own code, um, but if you're really feeling behind and just want to leapfrog to where we left off last night, you are welcome to use my own code. From here, I'm going to take the day three folder. I'm going to drag it down to the dock and have that open up in VS Code. I am going to go live so that I can see my project when I uh, as I left it off. And then finally, I am going to put the live share link into the live stream channel so you guys can go to file new window, click on the live share icon, click on the join button, and join the live share if you would like. Give you guys a minute to catch up on all of that. Make sure you've got your uh, server started. That is your go live button down here in the bottom right. Give you guys a minute to get set up, join the live share if you would like. Where did you put the link for that, Max? In the CIC live stream C4 channel in Slack. There it is. Thank you. Oh, one last step that you should do in a new Chrome window. Uh, pop open the portfolio site, the thing that we're modeling everything after. 
Um, that should be in tonight's. Uh, no, it's not in tonight's. Hmm. Okay, go ahead and pop open that final portfolio site link so that you have it up to reference it and go ahead and do your window management, kind of get things configured the way you want so you can fit it all on the screen. It won't let me use the link from yesterday. It says that session ended. Yeah, the new session's link is, is posted. You just have to scroll down to grab it. Yeah, I don't know why it won't show me everything. Hmm. Okay, there it is. So I'm going to open my weather.html. I'm also going to open my style.css, and I'm going to split them so that I've got both columns going on. And in my example site, I'm going to go to the make it rain and see where we left off, right? So this is our, this is what we want to work our way up to. This is what our final page is going to look like. Um, and if I come back over and I switch to my live, uh, my go live, right? My live server and click on make it rain, I get to this page here. And so I'm like, all right, we got our nav bar working. We got our responsiveness where we can click on it and that, have that pop up. We're in pretty good shape. Now we can dive right in to getting this working. Is that nav bar supposed to be on our profile, on our pro portfolio site? This nav bar up at the top should be there if you click on to the Make It Rain button. If you open up that weather project page, it should be there, not on the home page. Huh. Yeah, um, I couldn't get that to link. It just flies back up to the top. Okay, so check the A tag on index.html and make sure that that's linked to the right uh, HT, the weather.html page. Okay, thanks. Uh, give me one second. I'm just popping open something on my side and then we can dive in. Okay, so first thing I notice, I've got this big blue area. I want to set up my div to have this big blue area in it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna scroll down and I need to find the end of my nav bar. So I've got it, my nav opening class here. I need to keep scrolling down until I find that closing nav here. And this is my closing of the container. I know it's the closing of the container because it's highlighted up here at the top. So I'm going to leave myself a little comment in here that says end of container, which will tell me, hey, any new stuff I want to show up, I want to show up in a div in here. And I'm going to give that div an ID and let's call it project details. And the first thing I see in my project details is a H1 uh, make that an H2, make it a little bit smaller, that says, hey, the project that we're on is the weather app. So I save, I come over, and I see weather app here, but I don't have my background, and it's a dark font on a dark font. We need to fix that. So what I do is I go back over to my HTML, and actually over to my CSS and all the way down at the bottom, I'm going to target that ID that we just put on it called project details. Remember here, casing is important. I've got a lowercase p because I'm using that camel case. The uppercase is there and that's going to match the exact spelling and casing of my ID that I added on to that div there. So I want to put in a background 
And again, you can use whatever color you would like. I am going to pick this blue that I am already uh, using somewhere. And then last thing I want to do here is get my color, my font color to be white. So I get weather app showing up. And I lied. One more step. I've got this nice padding going around everything, right? The text isn't squeezed up right onto uh, the, the div, that background. So because I want the um, spacing to get applied inside the div, not outside the div, I'm going to go ahead and add some padding on there using 30px. That gets everything spaced out. Looks a little weird with this gap uh, underneath it, but that's OK. We're going to fix that in a second by putting in some additional content. So I'm going to stop there. I'm going to start a poll to give you guys a second to catch up. And I'm going to call on Schneider. Hey there. Uh, what's the point in camel casing again? Um, it's a consistent way of naming your variables. So we can't use spaces in IDs or classes. And so instead of using a space, we use that uppercase letter um, so that we can easily tell uh, the, the words apart. I just realized I'm muted. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Can I, um, I don't know where you did all of that. You went way too fast. Not the style, but where did you input your- I'm in the weather.html file. Oh, in the bottom. Yep. <laughs> I'm looking at the wrong one. Thanks. Yes, good note. We are we are in weather.html, right? And if you can't see that in your browser, um, scroll all the way down to the bottom and click on that make it rain button. And that should bring you into the weather page, right? So we're starting to work on multi-page websites here. That's going to have different information on every page. So um, looking at the uh, top tab of my screen share is also helpful knowing what files we're working in. Got 11 of 17 votes in. So it sounds like some of you are still working. Give you guys a minute. What am I doing? What am I doing? Got my nav bar. Oh, good. I was missing that weather HTML. I still had like the placeholder go somewhere thing. <laughs> I was like, oh. Do you mind just showing us what it looks like? Okay, why is it my way? Oh, haha, got it. Everyone good to move on? Any questions? <clears throat> cool. Okay, so. Next thing, I go back over here. I've got my weather app showing up. That's cool. Now I want to get my image to show up. But before I do that, I'm going to take a moment and stop and go, oh, I got to have some things show up to the right of that image as well. We can kind of plan this out and say, what if we make this whole thing one big row? Then we split it and say, one column is going to be here, and it's going to have the image. And then one column over here, and that's going to have our uh, details about the project. So I'm going to come back over here. I'm going to say, we... I'm sorry. Yep, go ahead. Can we try it? Sure. On our own? Sure. I'm going to type through it, but if you want to try it on your own, go for it.
And I will say one quick reminder to get that image to show up on my live site, the one that we're basing everything off of, you can right click on it and go down to that copy image address. And that's what you want to put in as your IMG SRC tag. You want to put in that whole link that you copied. This is what we're going for as the final result. Launch another poll, see where we're at. Hey, Max, question. Yeah, I've been doing it, but I never understood it. You know how you put like the plain text in between the tags? How is how does that just like show up? You know, like I, I would think it wouldn't like be red. You're saying like if I come down here and just add some text? Yeah, no, no, no. Um, like for example, the contact in between the the tags with the anchor right here and portfolio about all of that, like does the browser read that? The browser usually ignores white space. So uh -huh. it will ignore the new line here and it will it would ignore everything that got tabbed over here. And so it will only read what's between the closing tag and what's before the opening tag. I'm sorry, will only read what's after the opening tag and before the closing tag. Okay. And that's like, um... I don't really know how to form the question, but you know. This is this is allowed. This is valid syntax. Okay. I don't really know why Prettier did it that way. This is the way I would prefer it. That's how I would personally do it. Actually, yeah, that's how I do it, honestly. Yeah, I don't know why Prettier broke it up like that. Now that's really annoying me and I have to fix it on all of that. <laughs> Oops, sorry. <laughs> there we go. Now that's fixed. Okay. So what we did, looks like most of you guys are in. How are you feeling? You feel like you understood, hey, I'm going to, I'm using a column, so I got to put in a row first. Then I put in my column and I got to figure out the size. Then I put my image inside of that column. And when I came over here, the image was huge. So I came back over here and I could target that image in my CSS and say width 100%, but Bootstrap already has a class for me made for that, right? So if I just put that class IMG fluid on it, it's saying, hey, just like a fluid liquid, it's only going to spill into the area that it has room to. That column was already setting the width of it for me. So I'm able to say, just stay inside that column, pretend like you're fluid, and then it makes the image stay inside the lines there. The only other thing I'm gonna do to make this a little bit more polished I don't like those square corners, right? I want to make this look a little bit uh, a little bit sleeker. So what I'm going to do is inside my project details, 
I'm going to target my IMG and I'm going to put a border radius on there of 10 PX. That's just going to round it out for me a little bit. Um, 10 PX is controlling how round those corners are. The higher the number, the more curved it will be. Um, but I'm just going to add a little uh, rounding going on there. Now we come down here and I've got these two arrows. The idea on them is if I click on one of the arrows, it takes me to the next project. Okay, those are kind of cool. Let's try and get those to work. I want them to be in my column and I'm going to use my emoji trick. I'm going to do control command space and I'm going to do a search for arrow. And I get all of these different options. I'm going to pick um, this one. And I'm going to control command space again and do another search for an arrow. And I'm going to pick, nope, those are different sizes. Um... Well, that's weird. They've got the wrong sizes. All right, let me pick this one and this one. So they're just consistent. I'm using the ones that are a uh, couple couple uh, spaces down. So I come over here and I have my arrow showing up. They're tiny and they're not centered. So I fix that. If I go up to this call four and put a text center on everything, again, that's bootstrap helping us out. It got it centered. And now I can say, all right, I need to target these arrows. So I'm going to say, hey, in my project details, go find the call four. Again, I'm using my period here because I've got a class over here. And I'm using the pound sign here because I've got an ID of project details here. And I'm going to say, hey, make the font size there, I don't know, 36 pixels. All right, that's kind of cool. Now I'd like to space those out a little bit. Well, I can, I can't really add a margin on this because if I add a margin on the top, it's going to move that whole image down. Well, I need to target just these arrows. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put those arrows in a div with an ID of arrows. Then I take my arrows left and right. I move them inside of my div. And now I can say, hey, instead of targeting the call four, target my arrows. And now we can put a margin on the top of them that moves them down a little bit. And we should be good to go with that. Pausing there, letting you guys catch up. We put our arrows, we got those with the control command space. We picked out the two arrows that we wanted. We put them in a div ID arrow so we could target them and move them down. And then in here, we said, hey, let's put a little margin top on top of them to move them off the image itself. You launch a quick poll, see where you guys are at, and we will keep going from there. Ten votes in. We were getting thirteen before. Give you guys a minute. If you have any questions, definitely ask them now. Okay. Last call for questions. Okay. 
So now I come back over to my design and I go, all right, my arrows are here. That's nice. Now I need to focus on this area over here. Remember, this is going to be one big column and we may need additional columns inside of that. That's all right. So I come over here and I go, whoa, I've got div soup going on. Let's look at the div here that lines up with the end of my call. So I'm going to put a note in there that says end of first call. Then I'm going to come down here and go, oh, that's closing out my row. That is the end of my row. So I want to be inside the row still because the column is going to be next to the call for here. So I'm going to make sure that I'm between all of these different divs. I need to be between the end of my first call and before the end of my row. And now I can do another div class call in here. And I don't actually have to specify the size. I want that to be an eight, but because we already specified the four here, this column will assume to take up the rest of the space automatically for us. So now I can come in here and say, hey, I'm going to do my first div. And inside that div, I'm going to say, um, I'm going to put my uh, summary as an H4. And then in here, I'm going to put a P tag that says weather app that includes the format using bootstrap grid. You can put whatever you want in there, just uh, get our summary going. Then I go, ooh, hold on. Before we get objectives working, I have another column over here. OK, I can't just use a column, though. I've got to use a column with inside a row. Remember, our row is always what breaks up our columns inside other columns. So I'm going to say, all right, this div is the summary. That's what's holding this up here. So I need to come down here, say this is the end of my summary div. And I say need. Um, we don't actually need this comment, right? This is just helping us keep track of what is this closing div here. So if we close this one out, we can see that this is the end of project details call. OK, well, this is still project details that I'm about to work on next. So I'm going to do my div class. This time, we need to make it a row so we get access to our columns inside of that. So in here, I do my div class. And I'm going to say, hey, that's a call six. And inside that call six, I'm going to put a uh, H4 that has my objectives. And then inside of that, I want a UL tag, unlist, uh, unordered list is what that UL stands for. That's whenever we want bullet points, we use a UL. And then we use LI inside of it. Now you notice I've gotten very sloppy on my indentation here. I've got this closing div on the same line as the UL. My LI happens to be indented, right? But I've got this sloppy H4 up here. That's when Prettier becomes your friend. Because as soon as I hit save, it's going to move everything around on me and get my indentation fixed. So once you learn to use Prettier as a crutch, it becomes really helpful in not having to worry about your indentation because Prettier is going to fix it for you. That's not saying indentation isn't important. Indentation certainly is important, but Prettier can help you out if you're got if you have your syntax right. Prettier can fix that indentation for you. So I'm going to be super lazy here and just copy and paste some of these items in. Um, if you want to just say bullet one, bullet two, bullet three, I'm going to stop after this future improvements uh, step. So I've got my objectives. I come over here. I see my objectives are showing up. Now I want to get my future improvement showing up as well. And I want to note here 
this is kind of best practice for a portfolio is having some details about it, right? Every project is always going to have something else that you want to in, uh, work on next. That's what you can cover in the future improvements. You also want to tell the person, well, why did you build this project? What were you getting? What were you hoping to learn out of it? And that's the objectives that we do over here. So I find that the best portfolio sites are not just showing off what you've built. They're also giving you some documentation on the context of why you built it and what you want to work on next. Um, so I find that that's the most helpful portfolio kind of for me as an employer who's looking to hire someone. Okay, this project's cool, but why did you build it? What, are, what would you want to work on next? And what did you build it using? So anyway, I'm going to come back over here and I'm going to figure out, all right, I've got my objective showing up here. I want to get my future improvement showing up. So I need to say, all right, I need to be inside this row because I want it to show up on the other side of where the objectives are showing up. So I come down and I go, oh, a lot of closing divs here. I'm going to click on this one. I see that's closing out my column. So I'm going to add a note, end of objectives call. And then I'm going to go down here. I'm going to highlight my div. That's the end of my row for objectives and improvements. And then based off of that, I can put my cursor between the call six here, but still inside the row, do another div class call six and say, hey, I am going to put an H R an H4 in for my future improvements. And I'm going to paste in a couple bullet points inside a UL, save that, come over, my bullet points show up, and we are good to go. I'm going to launch a poll here. We will go on break momentarily, but I want to give everyone a chance to catch up and ask any questions before we officially go on break. Again, hitting on that point from last night. Yes, we just wrote a shitload of code, right? But breaking down those steps, saying, all right, I've got a column. I need to make sure I'm in the right row. I've got an H4. I'm going to add that in. I'm going to do a UL. I need to make sure that unordered list, those bullet points are still within that div, right? Hopefully you're getting in this pattern of seeing, yeah, we just wrote 20 lines of code, but those 20 lines of code are just columns and H4s and divs. And, you know, we're settling into getting content into our site and getting it laid out the way we would like. I'm sorry, I can't see to to put up my um my hand up. I can't find the button. I don't know what's going on with my Zoom. If you expoon, yeah, Max. If you expand your Zoom window down at the bottom, it may make the hand raise show up. Okay, now I see it. But when I uh, minimize it, it doesn't show up. Okay, for whatever reason. <laughs> Did you actually have a question or you just couldn't get your no, hand? No, I, I do have a question. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Um, So my, do you mind just showing us the website really quick? And then I can possibly show you mine because mine does not look like that. Sure. Go ahead and share your screen. If oh, you, I can do that. If you oh. are all caught up uh, or, and you feel like you understand everything we just did, not just a matter of getting it running, but understanding how it's running. If you are, you can go on break, be back at 7.30.
Go ahead, Alexandra. Okay, so I have that, but then my code looks like this. And then even if I ma maximize it, yep. it still looks like that. So and I did you, check and I was, sorry. Your, your row is probably closing before you would like it to. So, um, so this row is all the way down here. Okay, container. Let me remote control it. Sometimes I got to just click through things to figure it out. So yeah, you've got a call four and your call eight, and that is fine. But then inside of this call eight, right? Because this is the whole technical details. Mm -hmm. You want the objectives and the future improvements uh -huh. to be inside this call. So okay. I'm going to take this one div and move it all the way down here. And the beautiful thing about boot about prettier is that if your indentation, oh no, we got something mad at you. Mm. Prettier is mad. You've got a closing body tag down here, but I am guessing you're missing a div somewhere. Probably. Ah. So now our prettier has run. And I think if you pull up the browser, you should be good to go. I am good to go. Cool. Thank you. No problem. That's what I'm here for. Anyone else have a question before I go on break? Archer, go ahead. All right. So I'm, I'm looking at what you did. Mm -hmm. And... On ours, where it says, you know, objectives and future improvements. So if that is a, a row itself, as long as we cut that in half, the column's going to be six, regardless of how big it is. Correct. If you All don't, right, if you don't specify a size, it automatically assumes to share the space among them. All right. But it doesn't have to be the whole row of the whole width of the container, if you will, as long as we, whatever we specify as that row, no matter what the space is, the cow six is half of that. Correct. Okay. So when we say we've got a call four, I hate this color. I don't know how I ended up on it. Um, clear. Okay. We've got our call four here and we've got our call eight here. Now, when we put in this row right here, Mm -hmm. That reset it to a 12. So now the 12 is not based off of this all the way over to here. Because we put in a new row, the 12 is going to start here and go over to here. So when we do the six and the six, it draws the line between those two. Okay. Because that row is what resets the whole 12 from here into just the 12 being where that row is, which is here and here. This is my aha moment. <laughs> we like those. Alba, go ahead. Um, I just, I might have missed a step to actually put the um, spacing between the nav bar and the and the whole content yeah. section underneath it. That is in uh, project details where we set the background. I also set a padding of 30 PX. I did that, but mine doesn't look like it's doing it. Go ahead, share your screen. Hold on. Oh, you're looking for the arrow spacing, not for the, the padding, right? For this. Um... Oh, oh, you are missing a container. Let me request remote. Um, your code is here. My code, yeah, on the left. Yeah, okay. So... You've got your container, but you only have a class, not a class. 
you're missing an S right here. Okay. And there you go. And the arrows are not interactive yet, right? Arrows are not interactive, but we do, we did have them centered. Um, if you go here, why does it keep on? Um, we put a text center right here. And that's what moved those over for us. Great, thank you. Yep, you're all caught up now. All right, go on break. We'll be back at 7.30.
Welcome back, everyone. Hi, Max. Whenever you want a minute to get back on camera, and we will dive right on in. <clears throat> Those breaks aren't enough time for me to like do any chores downstairs or, you know, cook something or shower. So the office is becoming very clean. Yeah, it's good. Not that the breaks aren't long enough, they're great, but. You know what I mean. Probably. Yeah, the breaks are important. Only human nature to be able to focus for so long. So, uh, mm -hmm. okay, we are going to dive right back in. So we've got our summary. We've got our objectives. We're feeling pretty good. We've got this last section to do down here, this links and the tech stack. We've got a little bit of a footer down on the bottom. And believe it or not, we might actually get out of here a little bit early tonight. So let's dive on in. We've got our call six here, the future improvements. We've got objectives going on. We're like, all right, we know we need another row. We let's figure out where, where that is. So I've got my div class row here. This was the end of my summary div. So I've got to find all of this. I come down here. And I have the end of the row for my objectives and improvements. That's this one here. That must mean that my next div is going to come between the end row for my objectives and improvements, but before the end of the div for the project details column. So on mine, that happens to be uh, 102. So I'm going to do a div class row. I'm going to do my two div class calls in here. And this becomes an H4 for my links. And I do another div class call for my tech stack, which is also an H4. And I save and I cross my fingers and I come over and my links and my tech stack are in the right spot. So again, important just to trace through, making sure that your divs are going in the right place. Hopefully Prettier is hoping you, helping you out with that. So from there, I can put in my two buttons. And remember, we can use a BTN and a BTN primary, and that's gonna allow Bootstrap to hook into those buttons. So we will actually be linking these live later down the road um, to actually link to a demo of where it's running and to GitHub. But for now, we can just do demos. And they show up, but they're a little big for my liking. So we're going to need to fix that. I'm going to give you guys a minute, though, to catch up to getting those buttons in. Can we see how yours looks, if you don't mind? OK. Thank you. Yep. It's 
So we've got our buttons shown up here. They're not quite the, the way I want them to look though. So I go over to my CSS and I do, I start looking through it and I find that I've got this BTN primary with 100%. Okay, but we run into a problem because if we go back to our homepage, I want this button to be a width of 100%, but I don't want the button on my weather app page to be 100%. So I need to be more selective in this selector here and say, hey, I want that BTN primary. I've got to pop open my index.html and say, hey, where did I use that BTN primary? So I'm going to hit Command F, and that pulls up my search, right? I can search in my code. I use it for, oh, I'm in the wrong file. My index, I can hit Command F and do a search for BTN primary, and I find my send message button. So I'm going to scroll up a little bit, and I don't really have this in, I, well, I can go all the way up here and see my ID for that section is contact. So I'm going to copy that ID, go back to my style.css, and say, hey, this BTN primary, I only want that to be applied on the contact ID. So if I go back to my weather app, you'll see my links are now, those buttons are not full width. And if I go to the home section and scroll down, I still have my full width button styling here. But when I pop into the page, I get my button showing up as they should be. I'm gonna pause there, make sure everyone's following along. This is a really good one to make sure you understand why it's doing that and how we fix that problem. So just to reiterate, because you put uh, BTN as one of the, BTN primaries as one of the styles, CSS, uh, one of the styles, then it will automatically know that it's going to be under the index for the send button. However, because you put the contact ID, it, it knows that it's on, under the contact row. Okay. Section. Yeah, but Section. close. Yep. Okay. All right. Now, yeah, this, this BTN primary will apply to any BTN primary we create anywhere on any page that is using this style sheet. So we narrow down our selector and say, hey, the BTN primary should only apply to BTN primaries that are inside that contact ID. Gotcha. Okay. Archel, go ahead. I got lost after the the links and the and the H four size. Okay, we uh, just put in uh, two buttons, and then we modified our BTN primary to include contact in the style sheet. Right, I started typing mine out, but my BTN didn't change color after the class. It didn't. It didn't like you know. I was just. I don't know. So check your closing quotes and your closing arrow and make sure everything's lining up there. If it is, check the line above it and make sure the line above it looks right. And if it all of that looks fine, share your screen and we'll take a look. All right. Got nine of 16 votes in that poll. So I'm guessing you guys are still working or not voting. Hmm. All right, I found it. Good work. Thank you. What's yours look like right now? Could I see that please? Links, text, tag, okay. Get out of there. Yeah, that's not right. Mm -mm. I'm missing from the go.
anyone needs help, just raise your hand. Give you guys a couple more minutes here. Well, in that case, yes, please. Go, oh, no. Go ahead and share your screen. Okay, thanks. Just have to find you. Hmm. So first, this is what my Google Chrome is going to look. Oh, there we go. So this is what it looks like. Okay. It's not right. And then here is... Um, okay. Uh, you sh you uh, screen share just your Chrome window, so we can't see anything else. I think. Better. Okay. Um, let me request remote control. So we got a lot of red. Whenever we see red, we need to fix it before we just power through and ignore it. Because oh. while the browser may be powering through, um, it, it's going to cause issues out and other problems. So the first place I see the squiggly is right here. Mm -hmm. But there's nothing wrong with this line itself. The problem is with the line above it, it needs a semicolon. I didn't think to look in the, the CSS file. Okay. Same thing over here. We got our project details. We've got a squiggly. The squiggly is only there because it doesn't have the closing curly. Okay. I don't think that's going to fix your problem, but it's good to have valid CSS. Mm -hmm. So now let's go look at your HTML. Let me take over here. Um, OK, so we've got indentation issues going on. And your prettier is yelling at you down here and saying, hey, uh, there are so many closing divs here. I have no idea what's, what's happening. So we go div for containing everything. We've got our column here. Then we end our first column and start our next column. And this has your summary in it and the row. This div closes out the column. We open another column and then we close it here and close out that row. Now we open another row and put the column in it and close out the row and, I'm sorry, close out the column and the row. We don't want to close out the row. This tech stack is supposed to be in the same row as the links column. So we need to take out one of these. And that means this whole thing gets indented. Then we say, OK, this div is now closing out the row as it should. Um, mm. This div is closing out the big uh, the big column that holds everything. And so then we should just have two more divs. That's closing out the row that is holding the whole info section. And this is closing out the container. Mm -hmm. So all of this down here are extra closing tags that I don't know where they came from. Hmm. Okay. I may have deleted one too many. Oh, that's closing out the body. What are we missing? Prettier is yelling at you on. Here, you open a button, but you close a bouton. <laughs> okay. So let's close our button there and save. And now Prettier is giving you the check mark, and your indentation is right and good to go. Oh, so we come over here and you're all set. 
Now your buttons are a little wide there. That's because in the style.css, we found our BTN primary and mm -hmm. made that only apply, whoops, you made that only apply to the contact section on the home page. Now you're all set. Oh, okay. So we didn't want that same styling for this, just for the correct. Okay. All right. Thank you, Max. No problem. Christina, go ahead. Um, can you okay, so can you explain uh why sometimes we capitalize or don't capitalize? Lowercase um, everything unless the um thing that we're capitalizing has two words in it. Then we capitalize the first letter of the second word or any following words. Okay. Uh, I was just, I've seen it somewhere where the first word was capitalized and the second word, the beginning was cap. The first word was not capitalized. Now I don't know where I see it. So project details is a is a good example. We lowercase the first word. Yeah. Then we it. uppercase any the first letter of any following words. It's called camel casing. Okay. That, okay. That, thanks. Art Shaw, go ahead. Can you please make sure make sure that mine looks right? Yep. Go ahead, share screen. All right. Um Uh, not good. Um, we should have future improvement should be in its own column to the right of objectives, and it's not. That's what I thought. So let me request remote control. Okay. All right, so we're going to go up. We're going to go find our objectives, and you don't have a call six. You have a call equals six. So we save that and that takes care of it. And now you're all caught up. Okay. Glad it was an easy fix, but I probably wouldn't have found it. Thank you. Yep. We want to narrow in, right? The Where the problem is, is telling us either there's something wrong with the class, there's something wrong with the attribute that we're using to apply that class, or there's something wrong with the closing tags. And oftentimes it's as something as simple as hey, the columns over on the right don't work if the columns on the left are broken, right? So that call six, the second column was actually not the problem. It was that the first column wasn't set right. Any other questions or are we good to move forward here? Tina, you said you're making cards this weekend. I've got index cards always by my side. A good tip is most printers can print onto index cards. So if you find it easier to type them up and then print them out on your printer, uh, you can also do that. Takes a little learning of figuring out how to like rotate the page and get get uh, Google Google uh, Google Docs or the Pages app on your Mac set up for it. But if you set the page size to four by six, you can just put the index cards right in your printer and print on top of them. I do that for almost every presentation to print out my notes because my handwriting is atrocious. No, thank you. Okay, let's dive back in here. So I'm going to finish out my tech stack here. So for my tech stack, I already have the column created, but I want to create separate things uh, for each for each uh, each item on my tech stack, but I don't want them to be separate divs because if they're divs, they're all going to roll down onto the next line. So instead, what I'm going to use is a span tag. So I'm going to target my span, and I'm going to put my three span tags in. And we actually could use a class in Bootstrap. I believe Bootstrap calls these chips or badges. I can't remember quite what they call it, but sometimes it's actually easier 
to build our own styling than it is to build, uh, than it is to find the right documentation and bootstrap. So I come over here, everything's showing up fine, but I wanna get that styling um, applied. Now I could add a class to all three of these span tags and it would work, but that seems like a lot of extra code, right? That's not necessarily dry. So instead what we're gonna do is we're gonna add an ID up here for our tech stack. We're camel casing that, right? Capital S because it's the second word. Now I'm gonna come over here I'm going to target my tech stack, but I'm going to target the span tags in that tech stack. By using this one ID, I can target all three of the span tags without having to add a new class to all three of them. That is thinking in dry code. Don't repeat yourself. So I come over here. Now I can get fancy with my styling. So I can say something like, hey, I would like my background to be this color. And let's just shrink the font size a little bit. Let's say, eh, you know what? I actually don't mind that font size. So I come over here. Okay, that background's applied, but it's still not quite the way I want it to be. So let's say I'm going to add uh, padding and only a little bit of padding here. Let's say 3px. And then let's, uh, let's go up to five. And then we can just do a little border radius on that, uh, 5px as well. And now we get nice little badges. So hopefully some of these CSS properties are looking familiar to you. You're getting more comfortable and seeing, all right, we used border radius before. We want that background to be bigger. We want that background to be applied inside the border. So we're going to use padding instead of margin. We're going to get all of that working in here. While I'm at it, I'm just going to finish up this whole site with my um, footer. I know this is the end of my container. That means that in here, I'm able to put in my footer. I'm going to put my copyright symbol in with a control command space and grab my copyright. 2022 Zane Tech. Come back over. I look here. Whoa, where did all that styling come from? Well, because we use that same footer tag, the footer styling that we created on the home page is also carrying over to this page. So we actually don't have to do any additional work, which is nice. So we've got one more concept to cover. Going to give you guys a minute to catch up on the footer. And these arrows aren't going to do anything initially because this is where we're going to put this project down. If you wanted to keep on working on this portfolio site, you could go back through to your files and create a new a duplicate of the weather file and call it uh, Netflix or you know whatever project we're working on next. Um, and you could uh, set that up on your homepage to link to that other project that we're working on. So we're stopping here on just having one project set up. But if you wanted to, you could push yourselves to keep on making other index, uh, I'm sorry, other uh, files for your other projects and link them all together. Let me do a quick poll, make sure everyone is caught up who's been following along so far. And then we will wrap this up with a little mobile responsiveness.
your end product. Um, I'm just gonna make a comment. I don't yeah. like, um, I don't like prettier because when you do add a comment, it goes underneath, so it's harder to follow. That's the only reason why I don't like it, and it's confusing me. Um, <laughs> you're you're right, and it annoys me as well that the, that it, the comment doesn't stay on the right line. Um, mm -hmm. traditionally, in um. Traditionally, when you're commenting your code, you mm. normally put the comment about the next line above it, not on the same line. Um, and it's easier to read the comment because you say something like, this next line adds two numbers together. And then the following line, that's where the, the comment actually shows up. Prettier mm. is a little bit more aggressive on HTML than it is on JavaScript. Um, and so that's why it's moving that comment down. Um, mm -hmm. I do wonder if you move it up here and save. Yeah, see, Prettier doesn't like that. It does not. And I don't like that. I don't like Prettier because of that. Because in, in all honesty, I use the comments just like you do as notes on the um, on the codes that we're working on. So it helps me memorize exactly not memorized, but it helps me notate what I need to know. Oh, this is the end. This is the beginning. This is what this does. So and that's the only reason why I don't like it. You can move it up to the line above it. Mm. And I think that does help, right? Because you're saying, okay, this is the end of the container. That means that when we go over to that next div, that is that is the closing end. Yeah. So maybe that's helpful is to put it on the line above it and then Prettier won't move it around on you. It will keep it there something mm -hmm. worth trying. Mm -hmm. um, I will say that when you get um, when you get more comfortable with your HTML, these closing comment tags are a sign of an inexperienced developer. Um, if I read a code base and see those left in there, um, that to me says, hey, maybe you aren't trained yet to, to line up closing divs, which mm -hmm. is okay, right? The only way you get experience is by, by getting through it and leaving your comments in. Um, so it's it's like a it's a minor gripe to me, but at the same time, it's minor because I can go through and and line up the divs um, without needing the comment. So right, but for for the, for those of us who are just starting, they are very very helpful. Yep. No, I get it, and that and that's why I put them in in myself, right? Um, for for you guys. So um, there is. I think a way to disable prettier on just HTML and use it only on your JavaScript. Um, but if you want to turn it off for now, that's totally fine and turn it back on later and try it when we get into JavaScript, that's fine. Um, but I also know a lot of people will have, will give up on their indentation um, and, and struggle to find where the opening and closing is. And then if they have something like prettier on, it will actually move things over so that your divs line up and it's easier to see how it's supposed to be. So I, okay. I can definitely see both sides of it. Okay. All right. Thank you. Alba, go ahead. I don't usually use the, um, the comments, but I did have an issue with the prettier and the other code I was writing, um, where I put a class of about, and it doesn't like it. It keeps on giving me the red mark on the bottom, like I'm not supposed to be using the word about for a class. Is it still a problem? Um, yeah, it's in the other code, but I mean, I I kind of like click on the prettier thing and and close out of it, and the red will go away. But it keeps on doing it every time. So normally the problem isn't worth the word about. It's that you don't have like a closing tag matching it, or you're missing a closing quote, or prettier is calling out that there's a problem in your code, not necessarily that there's a problem with the word about in your code. Everything else works fine. It's just pretty much just highlighting the about there and the about in CSS. That's it. Do you want to pop open that it's code not, and share your screen? It's not in this code. It's in another. That's fine. Pop it open. I think it will be a quick fix.
Okay, so let me request remote here. So it's saying unexpected closing tag div. So we've got our P tag here and we've got our closing P tag. We've got a closing div. We've got a closing div here. Um, and then, so it's yelling not, it's yelling at 35. So 35 ID class, bunch of stuff in here. It's just a badge for um, LinkedIn. Close your A, you close your div. Um, so you close that A. Let me just move this down to make it a little bit easier to read. Um, okay, here's the problem. This div is outside the body. Okay. So if I move that down, um, It's still mad. On 35, this div, this div isn't closing anything out. Aha. So you had an extra closing div tag in there. Once we took that out, Prettier wanted to run on everything else. OK. All right. Yeah, so it's a, it, prettier is a double-edged sword, right? That it's it's it will tell you when you have some invalid HTML, but then it's like, well, I can't keep coding until I get that prettier fixed, so that you know my indentation is running again. Um, so even though it looked completely fine in the browser, it wouldn't have passed HTML validation. Um, so you know, pros and cons of using it for sure. Okay. Um, last thing I want to cover tonight, a little bit new uh, concept. I'm going to go back to my home screen. And on my home screen, I've got this contact form here, right? And when I grab this window and drag it in really small, as if I were on a, a mobile phone, you see how that first name, last name gets cut off and it looks really ugly? Well, what's the alternative to that? If I switch to... Um, if I switch to my live site and scroll down a little bit, when I pull this contact form over to a certain size, that, that goes full width on me. That is actually really easy to use uh, or build out using that grid system. So we've been doing a bunch of calls and just saying the number, but we can actually target specific screen sizes using those calls. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pop open my index.html again. And I'm only going to do this section, uh, only in this section, but you can use this concept anywhere else on your site to get things to stack on top of each other. So I'm going to go through and I'm going to go find my form, right? And in that form, I want to say, hey, this is going to be a call six on medium size screens. But on small screens, I want it to be a 12. And I'm going to do that same thing down here on this 6. I want that whole form to go full width on small devices. But as soon as you hit that medium screen size, which in CSS we call breakpoint, that is at that medium breakpoint, we want it to go shrink down to the 6. So I come back over here and without even resizing my screen, it automatically moved that form into place for me. But when I take this and expand it out, why can I not resize my window? 
When I expand it out, you'll see that form now is no longer underneath the text. It's to the right of the text. Do that again. If I pull this over, it goes under. If I pull it back out, it comes back up. Archrell, go ahead. So that small, was it small 12, medium six? So it gives, how can I say this? I guess when the aspect ratio changes um, from like mobiles and maybe even tablet, it still will accommodate the shape for the screen. Correct. It's less about the aspect ratio and more about the width of the page. The width of the page, okay. And we can uh, continue practicing that down here in the portfolio section, right? So we can come down here and say, hey, if it is, we have three calls here. We can say, hey, on a small screen, it should be a six. But on a bigger screen, it should be a four. Okay, well, that doesn't make any sense until we apply it to all three cards there. If we apply it to all three of the cards, and I come back over here, on my medium screen, nothing changes. It shows me those three columns. But as I get smaller, eventually we go to two columns, uh, six and a six, and then we've got another six down here. Expand that back out. And if we don't like that, if we go, hmm, I don't like that this is staggered, right? What we could do is say that last card is actually going to be a 12 on small screens. And then you can play around with the styling if you prefer that. Just showing you guys examples. You don't necessarily need to do that on the project section, but just showing you how that responsiveness works. For most projects that we complete, responsiveness will not be a requirement, but it is something important to think about, right? Because if you're out at OpenHack and you want to show someone the website that you've built, well, chances are they're going to be pulling out their phone and going to your website, right? So that mobile responsiveness is important because when you load the page, you don't want it to look like it was crammed into the screen. You want the layout to account for that smaller screen. So when you're using the, the uh, bootstrap grid system, it's very easy to target those different screen sizes. All right, I think we are ready to call it a night. Shall we generate some terms and get out of here? All right, pulling up the outline. What are some terms or phrases that we heard tonight that we would like to capture in a definition? Not, I guess is a term, the, the button we use today um, was the BTN and all that other stuff. Two classes uh, defined in Bootstrap that apply styling to buttons. Agonza. Exona. Exona. <laughs> um, well, you just mentioned it. M mobile responsiveness. Mobile responsive. The layout of our website responds to the width of the window or screen to make content easier to understand on all screen sizes. Brandon, go ahead. Uh, excuse me. Um, Breakpoint? Breakpoint. A predefined width where content automatically uh, sizes lays out differently. In Bootstrap, 
it is defined as small sm medium md large uh, lg and i've got to look this is a good example when we use the documentation if i go to the bootstrap website and go down under grid they also have a section for breakpoints so if i pop open those breakpoints they give me a whole breakdown of breakdown pun not intended but appreciated uh, a whole breakdown of how these breakpoints are working right and so they come down and they show you, hey, a small screen size is anything greater than 576 pixels, but it has to be less than 768 pixels because then we get into medium. So Bootstrap has an extra small breakpoint. That's anything under 576, but you don't need to target that with a class. It kind of just defaults to that. However, you can go all the way up to extra large. And in Bootstrap 5, which came out uh, about two years ago, screen sizes got so big that they added an XXL for screens over 1,400 pixels. 1,400 pixels is going to be bigger than a 16-inch monitor. That's basically going to be any external monitor. Um, and so with so many users now using external monitors, they go all the way up to XXL. But if you're wondering at what point, at what screen width this changes, you can always come back in and reference this table. What else? <clears throat> All right. I will stick around for the next five-ish minutes if anyone needs help or has uh, has questions. Otherwise, have an awesome evening. Remember, your homework tomorrow, super, super important. Your homework for tonight, for tomorrow, I should say. Brainstorm your capstone ideas. If you have a ton of them and you can't keep track of all of them, jot them down somewhere. Tomorrow, we're going to get started on the 30-second feedback form. Uh, we're going to recreate that in HTML and CSS. We're going to get you guys started on that as a group. Um, Ariel will stick around and help you guys on that assignment after we get it underway. And then I'm going to pick you guys off one by one into a breakout room, and we're going to discuss your capstone ideas. So that's what uh, to look forward to tomorrow. Make sure you've got your capstone ideas prepped. Other than that, have an awesome evening and I'll see you tomorrow. Quick question, sorry. Um, sure. So what if we don't end up choosing the ideas that we gave give you tomorrow? Like what if next week, by, the, by next week sometime, we decide, okay, we're gonna go with something else. Is that- That's I'm, fine. That's not gonna be an issue, okay. I would encourage you to schedule a one-on-one -on -one with me if you're going to change your capstone idea, just so that like we can have it documented um, for the Hack Up State team of like knowing what you're working on. Um, mm -hmm. We've definitely had people change projects mid mid uh, boot uh, boot camp, um, but we also don't want you to get to like week twenty and then be like, "I hate this. This is a dumb idea. I'm going to do something entirely different." Um, if you do that, then it's um, it's a little bit harder to apply all of those concepts. Um, so I would recommend mm -hmm. um, if you're going to change in the first couple of weeks, that's fine. Just shoot me a Slack message or schedule a one on one. Um, otherwise, um, you know, it's 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 no big deal. OK, thank you. No problem. Good question. Anything else for this evening for anyone? Have a good night, guys. See ya. Bye.